In section two of this chapter, we will be looking specifically at mixtures. But what are mixtures? You come into contact with them every day. They're just combinations of two or more substances that have only been physically combined. They can be easy to detect, such as the one that we see in the image of the salad, or maybe looking at a pizza, because these have visibly different parts. Or they may be harder to detect. They may appear to be uniform in composition. Things like milk, jello, air, brass, and even tea. Mixtures can be classified into two different types, known as homogeneous mixtures or heterogeneous mixtures. Now, which one they go into depends upon the distribution of their components, the size of the particles in the mixtures, and how uniformly the particles are mixed. Both go into determining whether a mixture is considered homogeneous or heterogeneous. In homogeneous mixtures, the particles are either atom or molecule size, and they're uniformly mixed, so they're not like clumped together in one area or another. Heterogeneous mixtures may or may not have visibly different parts to the naked eye. Suspensions are one type of heterogeneous mixture. Examples of suspensions include things like milk, blood, and aerosol sprays, where we can't see the visibly different parts unless maybe we look at it underneath the microscope. In a suspension, particles of one material are dispersed throughout another material in, in a liquid or a gas, but those particles will settle out if they're left alone. As we can see in this image, the beaker on the left has dissolved particles, and those particles are just slightly larger than the solvent particles that they're dissolved in. In the picture on the right, we can see a beaker that has suspended particles. The suspended particles are either larger or clumped together to make larger groupings scattered amongst the solvent particles, and this is an example of one that will settle out if left to stand. The mixture on the right in this image is a suspension. Now, red light is being shown through both of these cuvettes. The mixture on the right is a suspension, and we know that for sure because notice that the red light that's shining through it is getting scattered, so we can see that liquid appears to be glowing red. Whereas on the left, the liquid appears clear, and only a little bit of light bouncing off within the glass cuvette is actually being reflected for us to see it it's not a suspension. Suspensions have those particles that are suspended within the liquid and they scatter light because they're large enough to scatter light. The homogeneous mixture on the left has dissolved particles, but those particles are small enough that they do not scatter the light. When the composition of a mixture is uniform throughout, then it's called a homogeneous mixture. Now that's kind of a mouthful. There's actually another word that we use for these types of mixtures. Homogeneous mixtures are also known as solutions. Solutions appear to be a single substance, but actually they contain two or more substances mixed so thoroughly that the properties are consistent throughout the solution. Some common solutions you may come into contact with during the day are things like Kool-Aid. You know that it's a mixture. You know you take the Kool-Aid packet and you mix it into the water and throw some sugar in as well. So you're mixing several things together. Even the powder in the Kool-Aid packet is probably a mixture as well. Brass is another example of a mixture. It's a solid mixture. It's one that was mixed while the substances were liquid and then allowed to cool to form the solid mixture. Solutions include a category of homogeneous mixtures known as colloids. Colloids are solutions that have particles dispersed throughout but they're not heavy enough to settle out. However, they are large enough that they will scatter light. Examples of colloids include things like mayonnaise, whipped cream, jello, and stick deodorant. Colloids are the only solution that will scatter light, just like suspensions do. Suspensions have particles that cannot be seen, even though it's considered a heterogeneous mixture, unless you shine light through it. Colloids are considered to be solutions, homogeneous mixtures. They do have particles small enough that they will not settle out. However, the particles are not so small that they won't scatter light. So colloids will also scatter light. And this scattering of light is known as the Tyndall effect. Some of the most common solutions are made by dissolving solids and liquids. When you make tea or Kool-Aid, you're making a solution. Salt water is also a solution and you frequently have to make that before you cook pasta and other foods. 
Many solutions are actually mixtures of solids. Some of the most common are known as alloys. Some of the common ones you may be familiar with already are alloys such as brass. Brass is created using copper and zinc mixed together. Another one that's similar to that is bronze. It has a darker appearance, as you can see. It's made by mixing copper and tin normally. There's also steel, which is created by mixing iron and carbon and possibly other things. There's not just one type of steel. You can look online and you can see that there are over 4,000 different types of steel being used in industry. Stainless steel is made mixing together nickel, iron, chromium, and manganese such as in this sink. And sterling silver is a mixture of silver and copper. Gold is an element. However, the gold that you have in the jewelry that you might be wearing, such as a class ring or some earrings or something like that, is not actually pure gold. Pure gold is said to be 24 karat gold. An item that's only half gold, with the other half being other substances mixed in, would be considered 12 karat gold. The most common alloy used in jewelry is 14 karat, although you can find 10 karat gold as well, which is cheaper because it has a lower quantity of gold mixed in. Gold coins are actually 22 karat. They're not even pure gold because they stamp images onto these coins, and if they were pure, then it would be too soft to hold the stamped image for long. Solutions can also be created by dissolving gases in liquids. Anyone who drinks carbonated beverages should be aware of that because, as you've seen, when you pour a carbonated beverage, you frequently see a lot of bubbles coming out of it. And that's because there were gases dissolved in that liquid, and you can see the gases coming back out. It's actually really important that gases can dissolve in liquid because without it, fish couldn't survive, neither could other underwater creatures and underwater plants because gases need to dissolve in the water so that animals that live underwater can breathe, so that plants that live underwater can get the CO2 that they need to photosynthesize. Olive oil is a mixture itself and vinegar is a mixture, but those two individual mixtures are homogeneous mixtures. You cannot tell any visibly different parts within those. However, if you mix them together, olive oil mixed with vinegar, then you get a heterogeneous mixture because they won't stay mixed. Even if you shake it up, if you sit it down, they quickly separate into two distinct layers, and those layers are called phases. The term phase describes any part of a sample that has uniform composition and properties. So since olive oil and vinegar will not stay mixed together, they will separate into these two different layers as we can see in this bottom image. We can say that oil and vinegar exist in two distinct phases. Each part of a mixture keeps its identity no chemical change has occurred. Mixing is purely a physical change. This means that mixtures can be separated back into their individual components by differences in their physical properties. With a pizza, it might be as easy as just picking the parts off that you don't like, such as pulling off the pepperonis, or in my case, picking off the mushrooms. I don't do fungus. A magnet can be used to separate objects that contain elemental iron from surrounding objects that do not contain elemental iron, because iron is attracted to the magnet. Microscopic magnetic particles can actually be used to separate parts of a mixture as well. A centrifuge is used in medical labs to separate the different parts of blood. The centrifuge spins the blood in circles really fast so that as it spins, different components of the blood will separate out due to differences in their densities. We can see this in the image over on the right where the liquid plasma portion that has dissolved substances in it separates out and stays at the top because it's less dense than the other parts. There at the very bottom, you can see the erythrocytes or the red blood cells that settle out first because they're very heavy and dense. And then in the middle there, that white layer is called the buffy coat, which contains your leukocytes, which are your white blood cells, and your blood platelets. Those settle out together in that solid white layer. So you can get blood to separate into these different components just by using a centrifuge. A juicer that you may have in your kitchen also works on the same principles. Sometimes particle sizes are different enough that you can use the process of filtration to separate the particles. A colander that you use when you're cooking has holes in it through which some things can pass but not others. A coffee filter has 
tiny pores that will only allow certain size particles to pass through as well. Objects small enough to fit through the holes are allowed to pass. That separates them from the larger particles which are trapped behind. Now here we see a colander in the upper right and a strainer of sorts sitting in the sink at the bottom. When you're using a colander, we're collecting and keeping the larger particles, things like pasta or vegetables that you're washing or whatever. The small stuff that passes through the colander is considered the undesirable part, the water and all the dirt and things it removes. When you use a coffee filter to make coffee, the coffee grounds are retained in the filter and they're disposed of. We don't want that part. It's the liquid that passes through that we want to keep. That liquid that passes through is called the filtrate. Filtration can be used to provide fresh drinking water in areas that have contaminated water sources. Remember, any mixture in which the composition is not uniform throughout is called a heterogeneous mixture, and that includes suspensions. They may or may not have visibly different parts to the naked eye. All of the methods of separation that we've talked about so far can only be used when separating heterogeneous mixtures. They won't work for homogeneous mixture separation. So how do you separate homogeneous mixtures or solutions? If you have several liquids mixed together, you could separate them using a process known as distillation. This process depends upon reaching the boiling points of the various liquids. As each new boiling point is reached, that particular component of the mixture will boil off, go off as a vapor, and it will cool as it passes through this central cylinder known as the condenser and as it passes through there cold water is circulating around that central tube it's not mixing with it it's just circulating around it to cool it off and as it cools it that gaseous form that vapor is going to condense that's why that part of the apparatus is known as a condenser so that gas will condense and become a liquid and start dripping out the other end and it can be dripped down into a new flask known as the receiving flask. So that liquid coming out at that end is known as the distillate and that's what they're trying to collect. Now watching that thermometer eventually you will see the temperature begin to rise again and when it does you will see that no vapor is coming out at that point. It will stop dripping into the far end. You can remove that flask and stick a new flask in there and wait until that temperature reaches another stopping point and we start seeing vapor formed again as we have reached the boiling point of the next liquid. And you can continue in this manner to collect one liquid portion after another separating out the different components of that liquid mixture. Now the differences in the boiling and condensation points of the liquids is used to help separate them. This process is used to separate crude oil into all of its component parts that we can see here many of those different component parts in crude oil listed in this diagram. The heaviest ones will settle out towards the bottom of the entire fractionating column and the ones at the very top are ones that are much smaller molecules, more lightweight and tend to be gases or to become liquid at much higher temperatures. The distillation process actually can be used to separate a solution of a solid dissolved in a liquid as well. An example would be tap water. Tap water you think of as water, but really it's not pure water. That's why tap water doesn't taste the same here as it does in Galesburg, or as it does from well water out in the country, or as it does from any other part of the world. Tap water actually has a lot of dissolved minerals and things within it. It's just been made safe to drink. It's not pure water. So tap water is a solution that could be separated to be able to collect pure water. Um, another thing that you could do is if you had salt water and you wanted to separate the two portions, you could also use distillation for that. What happens in this case, if you've got a solid mixed in a liquid, the liquid when its boiling point is reached for that particular solution, the liquid portion will begin to vaporize. It will condense in the condenser once again as we spoke of before and drip down into the receiving flask. However, the solid will be trapped in the other container and so you will have solid left in the original container. The liquid portion that you boiled off is collected in the receiving flask. Those are a lot of different types of mixtures, different ways of separating heterogeneous mixtures and now homogeneous mixtures that we've talked about today. So I hope that you've learned a lot about mixtures and are ready to talk about elements and compounds as we move into section three.